Hiya, 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 and welcome back to another video. Today is going to be another guide. I am literally just going to keep making guides until I give you guys a free ticket to the end game. Today, I'm going to be talking about arcane symbols and dailies since they're mostly intertwined. And generally just my, just, just, just my tips and tricks and how to optimize your dailies and finish them as fast as possible so you can spend some time with your family, touch grass, or maybe even just play some more mushroom game. So just to go into a little more detail, I'm just going to be covering in this video how to get arcane force, what arcane force does, typically what arcane force you want to hit at specific levels, and you know just tips for your dailies, how to finish them faster, and how to get the most out of your dailies so that you can live your life because obviously you want your dailies to be done as fast as possible. But yeah, that's all I'm going to be covering, and I'll keep the intro short, I'll save you your time. Hopefully you guys enjoy, and remember to like, comment, and sub, or I'll literally eat your mesos faster than Star Forcing does. Thanks. Now, I forgot to mention this when doing the recordings for, you know, my basic explanation on arcane symbols, but basically, you level up arcane symbols by getting copies of each other by doing your dailies, and then spending mesos to level them up. With that out of the way, now we can get into exactly what arcane symbols are and why they're useful. So before I get into any of the dailies, the first thing that I want to talk about are arcane symbols. There is one for each region in the arcane river besides Tenebris. And every time you lock an arcane symbol, you get 30 arcane force. And every time you level it up, you get an additional 10 Arcane Force. Arcane Symbols can hit up to level 20 each, respectively. And the maximum Arcane Force is 1320. Now, you won't be hitting that value for a really long time if you're just starting the game now. But there are ways that you can get uh, Arcane Symbols besides just your dailies. You can get them from events and finishing the alternate regions like Selas, Reverse City, Yum Yum Island, so on and so forth. Now, another important thing to note, the reason why arcane symbols are also very very important is because for each for each 10 arcane force you get, you get 100 stat to go along with it. Unless if you're in a guild. If you're in a guild, you only get 30 arcane force from there and it doesn't give you any extra bonus stats. But when you get arcane force from leveling up your symbols or getting new symbols, you will get an extra 100 stat for every 10 arcane force. Now one thing to note, this stat that you get from arcane symbols does not scale with the percentages on your gear. so. You won't be getting a ridiculous amount of stat, but it's a good baseline and it'll really, really help you out in the early game, just like node stones. If you want, you can check that guide, it'll be up there if you want to know how to level up your node stones. But there are some milestones that you do want to hit in, uh, in terms of arcane force as you go along. Initially, you just want to make sure that you're at around 60 to 90, uh, like when you get to reverse city in your level 200s. When you hit Choo Choo, you want to be around 150 Arcane Force. When you hit Lachlan, you want to be around 315. Now, a big requirement for when you hit Arcana is hitting 540 Arcane Force. 540 Arcane Force is very important because not only will you be able to do the maximum damage to Lucid, but you will also be able to do the maximum damage to all the mobs in the Arcane River up to Arcana. Now, when you get to Esfera and Morass, you typically want to be around 700. 7 to 800 is a good ballpark. And then as you make your way into Celeste and Tenebris, you want to be in the thousands. Now, a reason why Arcane Force is so important, which is what I just mentioned like a solid 15 seconds ago, is that it'll help you do more damage to mobs and bosses in the arcane river. So 
when you have 10% more arcane force than the required arcane force in that specific map, you will do 10% more damage to the mobs in that region. So it takes your damage and it increases by, by 10%. Now the next bit is when you have 30% more arcane force than the region, then you will do 30% more damage. And then when you have 50% or more arcane force, then you will do 50% more damage. Now, the reason why this is so important is because the health of the mobs and the bosses in the arcane river expand explosively like they they grow a lot the final mobs that you fight before the arcane river have roughly around 40 to 50 million hp which is um stumps in future Perion, or typically the last mobs that you want to fight there are you know mobs in dark world tree or scrapyard that do have you know somewhere in the 100 150 million uh hp range but when you get into the arcane river and you're fighting mobs in for example like arcana or beyond all of those mobs have pretty much 500 million hp and beyond they have the health of pretty much your early game bosses so that's why node stones and arcane symbols become increasingly important because you need the damage boosts that you get from these specific systems now one thing to note if you join a guild, you can boost your arcane force by 30, which I highly, highly recommend that you join a guild. Joining a guild is super important and it gives you a bunch of stats. Not not even just the arcane force. Um, but you can also boost your arcane force from your hyper stats. So let's say if you're 10 or 20 short from hitting the next milestone that you need to hit, definitely do use these systems because they will help you out. Um, sometimes there also are like event related titles that give you extra arcane force for equipping a specific title. The title is the thing that you equip above your head, you know, like the Yeti X Pink Bean for example. But uh, yeah, taking part in events is also just a very very good thing because the amount of arcane symbols that they're starting to give out now is increasing more and more. Not only that, the good thing about um, good thing about uh, events is that you can you can choose which symbol that you want to get. So it's up to you on what you want to level up and what you don't. And speaking of leveling up your arcane symbols, the best thing that I can suggest is just doing your dailies as much as possible. Do your dailies as much as you can. Don't burn yourself out though, because the dailies are, or sometimes can be, fairly, fairly daunting in this game. So, do, do, do what you can. And with the event symbols, I suggest that you try to balance the levels of, of your arcane symbols. The reason why I say this is because the arcane symbol drops that you can get from monsters, which I probably should have mentioned... Good job, Backhead. Um, the arcane symbol drops that you can get from monsters are very, very rare. So realistically, the only XP that you'll be getting from your arcane symbols is through dailies. So you want to make sure that they're balanced so that you don't get time gated once you start hitting the later stages of the game. Now, another tip that I have for leveling your arcane symbols, or personally what I suggest is doing the best you can to cosplay Usain Bolt and sprint to level 235 as fast as possible. The reason why I suggest this is because you unlock all of the regions in the Arcane River, which not only makes your dailies a lot faster, but also so that you time gate yourself as little as possible. Because the Arcane River all depends on Asphera. Once your Asphera symbol is maxed, all of your other symbols should be maxed and you should be doing whatever you can to progress to the endgame bosses like Chaos Dark Knell, Chaos Gloom, and the Black Mage. Okay, so that's pretty much all you need to know about symbols. 
So now I'm going to be getting into dailies. I'm first going to start with Arcane River and then any other dailies that you need to know after that. So essentially in the Arcane River, there is two types of dailies for each region you go into. There is a quest daily where you just kill a certain number of mobs or pick up items or whatever. And then there is the party quest. Now for the party quest, there usually are some mechanics and I'll generally give some tips that you can get them done, done as fast as possible. But um, yeah, so for the quests, I'm going to be referring to the leveling guide a lot because kill speed is very important when it comes to these quests when you want to complete them as fast as possible. So starting in the Arcane River, when you go to Rona, if you're just level 200, you will have five quests, but because I'm level 262, you'll see that I only have one quest, All right? So if I go to Vanishing Journey Research, which personally, I don't even need to do this quest, but for this first quest, typically what you want to accept is any quest with Tranquil Urdas and Lantern Urdas. The reason why I suggest this is because not only is there the greatest amount of quests in this area, but it's also because the map is the best. If you're not strong enough to one-shot or kill Tranquil Urdas in a reasonable amount of time, then Sad Urdas or Angry, or yeah, Angry. I'm pretty sure they're called Angry, I could be wrong, but the, the Mad Urdas, you know, the Angry Boys, you, you choose that quest or Sad Urdas when you see them, and that'll, you know... That'll be the fastest way to complete it. Um, there also, when you do unlock Reverse City, you will also have some daily quests there. All the daily quests there are fine, except for the M Tower mobs. So if you get anything that involves the M Tower, please stay as far as humanly possible. Like just stay away from it. Don't touch it with a 10 foot pole. It's gonna take you forever if you were to do those quests. Yeah. That's pretty much it for the quest. Now for the PQ, it's fairly straightforward. You're gonna you're gonna go in, right? And typically, what you want to do is you want to hit mobs until you have around 50 to 60 Urda. And you can also grab these blue orb things to give you an extra 10 Urda. So if you want to go a little faster and you know that there's one of those in reach, then you can pick them up. There you go. You're going to use your interact key or the key that you use to talk to NPCs and you're going to talk to the thing in the middle. Now, what you want to do for this is you want to hit it when it turns purple. And what this will do is it'll spawn an orb. And with that orb, instead of taking the time to just push it around while walking, you can also jump while you can jump while moving or jump while pushing it. So what happens is that you essentially keep your momentum and move forward. So you can push the orb while continuing to move forward. And typically you only want to deal with one orb at a time because you can only push one orb. So essentially what happens is as soon as you push one orb, it'll turn purple again. Push the orb back. And then it'll turn purple again until you have the full transfer. The reason why I suggest 50 to 60 Urda is because sometimes orbs get destroyed by that red zone right there and there's nothing I could really do. So usually get a little bit of extra just so you don't have to repeat the process again. But that's essentially it. Just jump and push at the same time. You just have to get a feel for it. It's more of a practice kind of thing. And then when you get placed into the second zone, which I got this uh, quest for example, there's one of two quests. There's this, which is kind of like a tower defense, where you essentially just hit Urdas and you try to keep the monsters below 50. If it hits 50, then you fail the party quest and you have to do it again. Now, it starts by spawning mobs slowly, so don't feel pressured in any way if you don't do a lot of damage. At the end, it does start to spawn mobs a lot faster. So if you're ever finding trouble clearing the monsters, you can use this machine in the middle to spend 30 Urda to clear 15 monsters off the map. Now, 
It does, you do need 30 Erda to use the machine in the middle, but if you do clear the maximum amount of mobs, you will regain 15 Erda from the mobs that you killed. So essentially it only costs 15 Erda to use the full map attack, but you need to hold 30 in order to use it. So for example, let's let the mobs build up for a quick second. You can see that I have 120 Erda. And if I pop the machine now, I have, well, it was 105, but I was standing on the blue orb. And then that gave me another 10. So here, 115, I'm going to spend 30, it's going to go down to 100. And you can continue this process, 85. And then if the monsters go up again, 70. And then the next one will be 55, so on and so forth. And you're pretty much just supposed to sit here for two minutes because they thought that was a good idea, so... Yeah, that's that's uh, that's um, that's pretty much it for uh, VJPQ. Fairly simple. Just take out some mobs. It's just very tedious because it takes a decent bit of time. Now I can try. Let me try taking a second to see if I can repeat the repeat this repeat the Urda Spectrum and see if I get the other mini game so I can showcase that as well. So just give me a hot second. Now, one important other thing that I should note is that the machine also turns blue and red. So because if the machine is blue and you get a blue orb, you can push it into the blue orb, but you can notice that it'll only transfer one. So for example, if I were to do this, it would only transfer me one orb and the same thing with the red. The thing with the purple that makes it so good is you can push it into either either red or blue. And so I always suggest just getting a purple and then just jump pushing it. Okay, it seems like I still couldn't run into the minigame I'm looking for. There you go. Okay. Finally, so now we rolled this minigame. So you're going to carry over whatever Urda you have from the first stage to this one. Now, this one, basically, you just want to kill the mobs around you and continuously get Erda. And then you're going to use the machine in the middle to push the armors back into the cave. So I'm going to use my Erda now that I have. To push this armor back. There you go. Now that that's in the cave, I want to face the other way and push this armor back. So the laser is obviously going to point in the way that you're facing. So obviously, you want to be facing the armors. And two of them will spawn every time you clear the two that appear. So two new ones appear and I have to take out these two before the next two appear until you have five. Now, whichever mini game you get is random and typically this one is a lot faster because it only takes like eight seconds to push both of them in and you only need to push five in. Meanwhile, the other one you need to wait a whole two minutes. So. If you get this one, be very happy because you saved a whole minute from your life and you can't really choose which one you want to do. It's very, very sad. Yeah, that's pretty much it for VJPQ. It's either push the worms back in their little wormholes or play a def tower defense game for a solid two minutes. And yeah, that'll be it. The next region will be Choo Choo and I'll go over a lot of tips for Hungry Muto and the quests. There is a lot of tips for Hungry Muto so I'm going to try to keep it as condensed as possible. But no promises. Now, one thing that I want to note before I get into the Choo Choo region is that every time you progress to a new region in the Arcane River, the previous region's dailies, entry counts, or quest counts will be cut by one. So now that you've unlocked Choo Choo, you will only need to do four Vanishing Journey quests and two Vanishing Journey party quests. But now you have a new skew of dailies, Choo Choo Island. You're gonna have to do three quests from Master Lick, assuming that you're level 210. And you're gonna have to do three Hungry Muto party quests. Yet again, making the assumption that you're level 210. I'm 262, once again. I only have to do one of these. But, for the quests, it's very, very, very important that you know exactly what you're choosing. Now, 
if you have all three quests, it is best to try your best. It is best to try your best to make sure that you roll into the quests where you only need to kill one type of mob. So for example, you want to have a quest that tells you to kill pindeers or get their hooves. Uh, bighorn pindeers, uh, iwanawas, uh, ramanamas, because they're over here. You typically just want these quests because the thing is, for example, let's say if you get an angry fly-on or a fly-on quest, there's no map where you can concentrate on just focusing on taking out either the fly-ons or the angry fly-ons. Now, if you get a mix of both quests, if you get an angry fly-on and a fly-on quest together, that's fine because you can hold the same map. Essentially, the what you want to do for your dailies is to make sure that you're moving and shifting maps as little times as possible because it essentially reduces the amount of time that it takes for you to do your dailies. If you're just moving around and, you know, it, it's a lot of unnecessary time because once you get a decent bit of drop rate and your kill speed goes up, your dailies start to finish like this. So having to switch to the maps really increases the time that it takes. Now, another thing that I can suggest for the, for the dailies, don't accept any quest that involves the the gorillas or the bird sharks these are awful quests seriously you're going to be wasting like five minutes if you get any one of these quests um the catfish is fine and the rye turtles rye turtles are good boss rye turtles not so great unless if you have rye turtles now if you do have yum yum island unlocked i'm pretty sure all of the quests are good because there is you know focused maps for each mob so if you do get yum yum quests for my people who are level 215 and above that's fine. You're doing great. Now, that's it for the dailies here. Um, the, oh, right. One more thing. There is also a quest called Obtain Master Licks Recipes. If you get that, always keep that quest because that quest is universal. Doesn't matter what map you go to, you will get the draw for Master Licks Recipes. Now, on to the party quest. Hungry Muto. Now, there's three difficulties. I always suggest that you only do normal or above because normal gives you nine symbols for the three times you do it and hard gives you 15. If you are not doing solo progression, I suggest that you just ask somebody to carry you through hard because getting that extra six symbols a day is massive. It is so good and I suggest that you do it, you know, pretty much as much as you can. If you have somebody to be a, a, a leech off of. Now, for now, I'm going to enter into hard. I highly suggest that you don't ever do easy because easy is literally way too easy. So I'm going to go into hard. And now, you'll see that there is a recipe. Now, you need to fulfill this recipe within the bonus time. Because if you don't, then you won't get enough meter to get the maximum amount of symbols. You need to clear this within, I think it was five or six minutes. I'll, I'll probably put I'll probably put a time like somewhere somewhere there, right? Now, what you want to do essentially is take out the mobs to get the ingredients, and you know, basically just get the ingredients so that you can basically fuel Muto to be, beat up a giant fish is essentially the the idea now you can use the water for fast transportation back to the center now another thing you can do if you want a cheat code is you can use the water if you swim to the bottom you can either teleport to the to the wolf fruits or to the fly on. So if I were to swim to the bottom left, I swim to the fly ons. And if I swim to the bottom right, so you don't have to go very far to the right. It can just be, you know, just right of the center to the bottom to the wolf fruits. So let me show you what a typical run looks like. Now that I'm pretty much done explaining what I need to. Now, sometimes there will be question marks. 
Typically, it's just memorization. You just need to know what's in the recipes. Eventually, you'll get the hang of it. But for now, it doesn't seem like we're running into that. So we can kind of just beat up the mobs and go along our merry way. Now, in this map, you have to pick things up manually. Your pets will not pick things up for you. So just have your pickup key bound. So for me, this is a question mark, but I know that the only object that requires one is the Slurpee Fruit, which randomly removes across the map. So I'm going to look for that first, just so you guys know what it looks like. Right. So it's always going to be at one of the mobs. This time it was at the gorillas. So you're just going to take out the Slurpee Fruit, get his fruit and deliver it just like any other item. Yet again, whole lot of memorization, just something you just have to practice if you're doing it yourself. Now, one thing to note is that in this map, the items affected, uh, the, the items that are dropped by the mobs are affected by drop rate. So if you do have a high amount of drop rate, that, uh, that is very good because it'll make your dailies go a lot faster because a lot of the mobs, like the wolf fruits especially, do not have a hundred percent drop rate but because my drop rate on my equipment is so high the items are dropping pretty much a hundred percent of the time so that's one important thing to note um not only that holy symbol is also a good thing to have for this party quest specifically because obviously holy, holy symbol increases your drop rate so it's it's a good thing to have so yeah that's what uh hungry muto looks like and then you just claim your reward and she'll tell you, wow, look, you completed it in an absurdly long amount of time. Usually this, is, this should take like a minute and 30 seconds to two minutes if you know what you're doing. And then she'll say, wow, you got rank S and she'll give you your symbols and a good amount of XP. The XP goes up, you know, obviously depending on the difficulty. So the higher the, the difficulty, the better. So yeah, that's pretty much it for... That's pretty much it for Choo Choo Island. I don't think there's anything more. So TLDR, use the water when in Muto to teleport to specific sides of the map. Um, the thing is you can't teleport upwards. So if you have anything that involves the bird sharks or the gorillas, then you're gonna have to go up there manually. It's like those gorillas and bird sharks are always just a pain in the ass, but you know, Beating them up is just so, so very satisfying. Yeah. Next place is Latchlin. Once again, uh, the, the, this is the whole point of the video. I'm going to be going over every single thing you need to know and just some extra tips to make things a lot easier. Make your life a lot easier and, you know, make things go by a lot faster. Okay, so now that you're level 220 and you're finally in Latchlin, the dailies start to become a lot faster, I would say, because not only do you start to scale with the monsters a lot better, but the fact that you don't need to do three choo-choo runs or three muto runs is a lot better, and you only need to do one VJPQ, which in my personal opinion is the worst one by far. But now you unlock three Latchland dailies and three Dream Defenders. Now, Dream Defender takes like 20 seconds, and the dailies in Latchlin are pretty much all good. You cannot go wrong with any of them besides anything in the clock towers. So if you get dream keepers, um, blue eyed or red eyed gargoyles, I would suggest skipping those. Weakened dream keepers are also not that great, but if you mob decently well, then there's no need to skip these. There's also no need to skip on any other quests that you get. The best dailies are Insane and Angry Masquerade Citizens, Citizens. oh my god, whichever one you get uh, are completely fine. Um, even the Galluses and Galenas are the best, but if you don't roll into them and you roll into Angry Victory Plates, for example, that is still fine. Like, these dailies are still good and you'll still just breeze through them. Now... Dream Defender, you have to go to Latchlin and talk to Flopsy the Dreamweaver. So, when you get to level 220 for the first time, 
Doing Dream Defender will start you at floor 1. And every 10 floors you complete, there will be a checkpoint. So for example, because I've cleared everything up to 100 and I've never gone further beyond because personally I didn't need to, my Latchland symbol was maxed by then. But every 10 levels you get a checkpoint. Not only that, every 10 stages or 10 levels or whatever you want to call it also indicates how many symbols a day you will get from Dream Defender. So for example, if I get to stage 100 and I clear this 3 times a day, I will get 10 symbols from Dream Defender and then 8 symbols from the Latchland Daily Quests. Now, when you go into Dream Defender, it's fairly straightforward. It's like a tower defense game where you need to destroy the music boxes that are colored purple until the gauge at the top fills up. What that gauge means, I don't know, but destroying the music boxes essentially fills up that gauge and brings you to the next stage. Now, there will be monsters that will spawn in those areas and they will try to turn those music boxes back to the purple state that they're in. And you have to kill the mobs and kill the music boxes so that they don't turn back to their original state. Now I'm going to show you what a typical run of Dream Defender looks like. So you're going to go in and there's pretty much going to be mobs so I, you just need to hit the mobs until you break the boxes. See the thing is I'm not in my damage gear right now so I probably don't do enough damage for this but that's fine. And there's going to be a mini-map at the left that tells you exactly what's being destroyed, what's in your control. So yellow is what's what you're controlling right now. The purple is what's in their control. And then there's going to be this like weird like transitional like that 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 weird like flashing icon that shows that this is about to be taken over, you need to fix it. Now, there also are power-ups that you might have noticed here. And there are four of them. Typically only one is good and I only suggest using this one, but I will go over all of them. The power-up that costs 200 points will freeze the gauge in place for 5 seconds. That is very useless. Because essentially, it doesn't really help you achieve anything unless if you're, you know, about to overtake most of the music boxes. Wake Up Call, this is the best one. This one costs 300 and it destroys a nightmare music box at random. So it basically puts a box at your control at random. Call Flopsy, which is 400. Mister F uh, Calls Mr. Flopsy to lure the nearby monsters away for 15 seconds. To be honest, I don't even think I've ever used this one. This one is really, really bad. Um, Kaboom eliminates all monsters on the map and prevents them from reappearing for 10 seconds. Now this one's pretty good, it's just that it costs a lot, so it's not worth your time. Not only that, uh, I probably should say how you get these points. So every time you clear a stage, you'll get 10 points. So in your first run of Dream Defender, as you're trying to climb up as far as you can to see how many dailies you can get a day, you will obtain a lot of these points. But through your dailies, it's probably going to be a slow grind that you'll eventually have. But that's fine because you should only be using these points when you're trying to push for a new stage. The reason why you want to use these points is because your burst won't always be up. So clearing a new stage will sometimes be difficult. So for example, let's say I am making the push for 210. Let me get into my damage gear. Just to give you guys an example. Not only that, throw out these dream coins. I don't need them. My symbol's maxed. So let's say I'm doing that again and I go to stage 100. Let me buff up and everything. Let me get all my damage on. So let me just put the deployable. Take that into control. And that, not only that, sometimes it's also smart to use guild skills. And, you know, Monster Park potions and other 30-minute buffs. 
when you're actually climbing because it'll help you give you the damage that you need until you get to the stage where you where you have a checkpoint. And there you go, that should be stage 100 cleared. So now that I don't have bullet bills, let's theoretically say that this stage is going to be difficult for me, which I think it will be because 101 there was a big spike. Right, so let's say this stage is theoretically difficult. Or actually wait, let's let's wait for one more stage. Okay. So let's say that stage 102 is difficult for me, right? So typically what I want to do, and let's say that I have no burst active, typically what I want to do is I want to take control of the box randomly. So essentially what that'll do is that'll give me a huge boost that'll pretty much clear the stage for me within like a couple seconds. The reason why this ability is so good is because taking control of a box early will pretty much give you all the gauge you need to move on to the next stage. And it only costs 300 so you can use it multiple times over. You can technically use it 10 times until you get to the next until you get to the next checkpoint. Assuming that you have the maximum dream points accumulated of 3000. So here, even though I don't have burst or I don't have anything to help me, you know, do a whole lot of damage, I pretty much took out the stage before I was even like worried or concerned or anything in between. And then we just pop this, that'll take care of the bottom. And then we go here, do that. And there you go. And then you can just keep doing this all the way up. And that's pretty much all Dream Defender is. And okay, wait, I think I've made a mistake on how dream points are accumulated. Okay, here. So for every stage you clear, and I'm going to quote this from the Maple Wiki, you will obtain dream points based on the stage that you completed. Stages 1 to 19 will reward 10 points for each. And starting from stage 20, every 10th stage will reward an additional 10 points. So 20 to 29 will give 20, 30 to 39 will give 30, 40 to 49, 40, so on and so forth. So because I was at stage 100, right, I was making 100 points per stage. And obviously that continues to trend upwards until, you know, however far you can go. But yeah, that's pretty much it for Latchlin. Next is going to be Arcana. Now Arcana, I do have some explaining to do because there is movement tech and... You know, at this point in time, you should be getting really familiar with this, with your class because it'll help you, you know, basically give you the skills that you need to do Spirit Savior, which is the, I guess you could say the hardest party quest of the bunch. So, now that you're 225 and you're in Arcana, your dailies are going to start to get a little funky, especially at the level 225 to 230 range. Once you're 230, pretty much any daily that you get in Arcana is good. Just try to mix and match so that you have dailies in the same area. Like as I was saying previously with Choo Choo, Lachlan, you know, same thing. You just want to make sure that everything is within the same map so you don't have to move and waste your own time. Now, if you are in the 225 to 230 range, you will find that killing a lot of the cave mobs is going to be very difficult because the level difference between you and the mob is very steep. So, I suggest that when you get to Arcana, when you first get to Arcana, try to land dailies that are within the first sector of the map. So. Water spirits, sun spirits, earth spirits, even if you get like snow cloud and thunder cloud spirits, it's fine. But typically try to stay away from these dailies like the befuddled, mournful and anguished spirit dailies until you do enough damage. 
because realistically the XP that you get from killing 200 mobs is not that significant and the time that it would take you to finish your dailies assuming that you don't one shot would be much much longer than if you were to just go to a worse map and one shot. So that's pretty much all I have to say about the dailies. Now Spirit Savior is funky. Um, you need to be very good with the movement in your class because this party quest involves a lot of movement because you need to make sure that you are not getting hit by the spirit that chases you. I'll explain what I mean in just a second. So let me just go in and give you generally a good idea of what Spirit Savior is supposed to look like. So when you first enter Spirit Savior, you can first of all click this button, uh, the, the button beside the world map, to expand to see the entire map so that you know exactly where the spirits are that you need to save. Now, what you need to do in Spirit Savior is basically break the spirits from the roots, press the interact key and move along. So I'll, tip, I'll show you what a simple rotation in Spirit Savior looks like. And there you go. So essentially what you want to do is you want to save five of these little guys before returning to the center. Now, typically what you want to do is you want to start by grabbing the guys at the bottom and then moving to the top and converging back into the center. There are only specific spots in which you can down jump to return to the center. So for example, if you're down jumping on this platform over here, you can't do it because there's nothing below you. But if I were to go slightly to the left over here and down jump to the platform right below me, then I can do it. And then you move to the right and then flash jump to the center and inversely if you were on the left side. Now, saving a certain number of rock spirits gives you a different number of points. If you only save 4 and bring them to the center, it will give you 1,500 points. If you save 5, it'll give you 2,500 points, and 5 is the maximum. So typically you want to go for the maximum before you return to the center. Saving 3 only gives you 1,000. Saving 2 and 1 are pretty much insignificant, and you should never ever do that. So, to be honest, I don't even know how much they give. Just don't even do it. It's not worth your time. You know what? Let's test that now, actually. So saving 1 only gives you 200 points. Saving two gives you 500. And saving two gives you 500. So you wanna stay away from saving one or two because the return on saving more rock spirits at once is so much better. Now, Typically what you want to do for a Spirit Savior run is you want to make sure that you're getting 10,000 points every run. This will ensure that you get the maximum amount of coins from your dailies which will give you enough to get 10 symbols per day from Spirit Savior. So the distribution is going to be 10 symbols from Spirit Savior and 8 from the dailies giving you 18 symbols overall in Arcana which is very very good. Hence why I suggest that you don't level up Arcana through the symbols that you get through events and stuff like that. Right, so let me show you guys what a typical Spirit Savior run would look like. Now, I'm a Cannoneer, so my the movement that comes with my class is also just very strong. So it may look a little easy, but it might look a lot different on your class. So take this with a grain of salt. And uh, yeah, let's see how this goes. Hopefully I don't mess up because I still sometimes have trouble with this. It is not the easiest party quest or not for those with, you know, faint of heart to say the least. Now there are also bungees on the side that you can use to quickly converge to the center and create a big amount of space between you and the spirit. Not only that, if you lure the spirit close, you can easily kind of just jump around it because its movement is like kind of jank. 
Yeah, you can take this bungee to go to this bungee, and then that bungee will take you to the middle. Obviously, you can still flash jump when taking the bungees to move in, you know, other specific ways. But because I've been doing this for a while, it all comes second nature to me, so... This is just another one that I suggest practicing. So you start at the bottom, you take the bungee to move out. Grab the one over here. Take the bungee to move in. And then grab these three along the side. And you can see how far the spirit is away from you on the map. Hence why I suggest increasing the size of your map so you can get a good idea as to how much space you have. So once again, we start at the bottom, grab this, bungee to the middle, center up again. I grab the rope by accident. Yeah, you also want to make sure that you're not grabbing ropes or doing anything silly like that because grabbing ropes wastes a lot of time. You want to make sure that you're always on the move. Now I can just converge to the center and then we reset. And then we can take this bungee to converge to the center faster because I know that there was nothing on top of me there. Oh, a little bit of a movement mishap. Okay, and then we can use this to converge to the center quickly. But yeah, realistically, I'm already going over the max. I don't need to go this far in terms of how many spirits I get, but I guess we can call this a flex as to how much I don't touch grass because I can do this all day without, you know, I guess you could say ever messing up. I'll probably even jump over here and then do that and there you go almost the 20k achievement so that's typically what a run would look like obviously you don't need to go overkill like that obviously because I know my movement and where I can move around I jump in specific places that makes this run look a lot faster it's okay to take your time you can see how much headroom you have to get much more points than what you need so please take your time and learn it. Go slowly and take safe rotations so that you don't get hit by the spirit guy or whatever you want to call him. Always take the bungees when you're, you know, always take the bungees when you're about to converge and, you know, return all of the rock spirits because that gives you a huge amount of distance so that you can find your footing and get back to get back to the center and return everything you need. That's pretty much what Spirit Savior looks like, and that's pretty much what it's cons consistent of. You just need to know your movement and, you know, get comfortable with the platforms and what each of the things do in the map. Now, one thing I suggest for Spirit Savior is having rope lift. Most classes will need rope lift for Spirit Savior. It'll make your life so much better because essentially it'll give you a huge amount of vertical mobility without having to consume your flash jump. The reason why this is so important is because you start from the bottom and you have to move to the top. And sometimes you can't really take the bungees to move to the top, sometimes you just have to rope lift to go up. But yeah, that's pretty much it for Ar Arcana. And I'll quickly cover Morass and Asphera, and then any other dailies that you might want to consider. You are now 2.30. Congratulations. Morass. Pain. Suffering. A lot of terms that you would use together. Um, morass just sucks, so if this takes you a while, that's, uh, not my problem. <laughs> okay, no, but seriously, the, the best dailies that you can get for Morass are the ones at the beginning. Uh, Xenodroid, Echo Type B, and Type A is typically what you want to go for. Nameless Cats uh, are fine. Uh, so are the bullies, or the gangsters, sorry, if you go in Bully Boulevard. 
Anything beyond that, anything that involves that day in Truffit, please get rid of it. You, you will literally be there for like 15 minutes if you get a quest here. Please, it, just like if you get like experiments gone wrong or like, you know, just anything that isn't that day in Truffit, that day in Truffit is that day of misery, all right? Just stay far away from it. That That's all I have to say about the dailies. Just stay away from that day in Truffit. On the other hand, the party quest is also suffering. This is like, <laughs> there's nothing good about Morass. Like you just, you go in, you hit monsters, and then it'll give you a notification as to where the boss is. And you just, you beam that boss. Let, let, let me just give an example. So pretty much you just hit mobs. If they would spawn. Okay, your meter fills up and it'll show you where the boss is. You typically want to stay in the middle. You can also look at your mini map and it'll show you where. You just beam it, kill more mobs until the yellow meter fills up again. Look for where the boss is. He's at the bottom left this time. Beam him. So on so forth until you get to 10. Now there's going to be a boss at the end. And the boss you'll need to beam three times, but every time you beam him, you will move in terms of location. So, just to be aware of that. With that, I'm full again. Where are we headed to this time? Oh, right in front of me. Yeah, typically... Oh, I swear I... Th okay, there you go. So, you typically want to stay in the middle, or at least I'm making that assumption. I haven't done this party quest very much. We want to stay in the middle so that you're not necessarily far from whatever position it spawns in because from what I've tested it is seemingly random because, you know, I mean, what else would it be if it wasn't random according to Nexon? There you go. Another one. Round seven. Continue in this way for a bit. Alright, right in front of me. right in front of me again okay you know this is this is very nice okay if it would work thank you so now the boss spawns and essentially just it's it's j just treat it like a normal mob it'll show you this whole warning thing and pretend like it's all scary and stuff but it's really really not the case it's just fairly average and he spawned pretty much in the same spot again and then once you do that it goes to 10 and you clear Morass, very uninteresting, just painful, and that's pretty much it. I will cover Esfera and Tenebris to the best of my ability, and then we'll move to other dailies that you will need. So, if Morass's name was Daniel, then Esfera is pretty much just the cooler Daniel. Now, Esfera is still suffering, and it's still pretty hard, but at this stage in the game, your damage should be scaling with the mobs, so in most cases, you will be fine. Unlike Morass, Morass is... Uh, I don't want to talk about Morass anymore. Uh, essentially, the same thing as Morass, just try to stay in the early maps as you progress into Esfera when you're level 235. It doesn't necessarily matter what m mobs or quests you do once you one shot all of the mobs here but for the time that you are not one shotting the mobs just stay in the early maps just like the other regions that i covered previously nothing new here now the party quest on the other hand i'm gonna be honest this is literally my first time entering it i i i still have the dialogue um mm. okay so the the party quest is fairly simple. It's mostly just hit mobs and then you use this turret to shoot these stars from the sky. Now the only thing I can suggest for this is to memorize the angles you need to shoot the stars because if you use the laser mode, it eats three times the, you know, the gauge which will make your dailies go a lot slower. So essentially it goes like this. Yardy, 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 so you can, I can't even go that far, but the mobs are going to spawn here, clear the mobs, and I'm one-shotting. I am doing pretty much the amount of damage that I need to do to take out every single mob possible. Alright, so once you do that, you sit here and you 
Need to use the sit button. I don't even think I have my sit button bound. Okay, let's bind my sit button. So you bind your sit button, and essentially you just want to aim for the stars in the sky. Now, you can look at what you're shooting at. Doesn't really help that much. But essentially, you want to do this. You want to adjust the angle, give it some power, and shoot. Now, yet again, like I was saying before, there is a laser mode, which will show you exactly what you're trying to shoot. But yet again, this makes this process a lot slower. Hence why I suggest that you just, you know, figure it out normally. I mean, not only that, you can switch between the two modes and move your camera to kind of help give yourself a guide as to where it goes. Not only that, when you're... When you're in this like normal firing mode, um, there's usually like drop off, so you need to be careful of that so that it doesn't drop off and hit nothing because that would be very sad. Essentially, you just want to this fire and then continue pretty much all the way. I'm actually doing a pretty good job for my first time. You know, I'm happy about myself. Look at this. I'm, I'm so amazing. Look at me. So then you just, you can just use the laser to help, you know, give yourself an idea. So like I can go up here and then maximize my power. Hit that in Narnia. Lower it a little bit. Do that. Okay. And then lower a bit again. Okay. And then do that. And I missed. Okay. Uh, this is awkward. Um, one more shot, I believe. There you go. See? And that's how you do the daily. So when you don't use the laser, you can pretty much do it all in one go. It's just, yet again, memorize the angles because it'll make your life a lot easier because the time that it takes to recharge is so ridiculous. Considering that you have to do that three times a day, you know, I would lean towards just don't even do this one, but if you really, really need the symbols, like it's, you know, like it's fine, like go for it, but it takes a lot of time. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty much it for Aspera. Now in all of Tenebris, instead of giving you symbols to level up your arcane symbols, Tenebris is fairly straightforward, so every time you finish a daily in Moonbridge, Labyrinth of Suffering, and Limina, you get one Spark of Determination. And there is only one quest for each Moonbridge, Labyrinth of Suffering, and Limina. And respectively, when you unlock these regions, it also reduces the entry counts for Esfera, Morass, and beyond. Well, obviously, only to a minimum of one. So you still have to do one of each, assuming that you don't have VJ Max, for example. So... Realistically, Moonbridge, Labyrinth, and Limina are fairly straightforward. Each of these quests is just kill 200 of a specific mob. This is only if you want to min-max your sparks for the Black Mage. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Any any map is good because a lot of the maps in these endgame regions are good enough to kill 200 mobs. You won't you won't be troubled in any one of them. So. If you want to do them, it's totally optional, just, yeah, if you want extra sparks, you come here and do the dailies here, these are totally optional, you don't even have to, because realistically, if you can kill normal gloom and normal dark knell, then you get sparks that way, like for example, I don't do my dailies on this character, and I have 305 sparks of determination, and I already have 4 black mage keys, and I'm literally level 262, so by the time I get the Black Mage, I'll probably have like 20 of these things. So, yeah, totally unnecessary. Pretty much just reduces the count for the previous regions, and if you want them in max, you have the option. Okay, so now that I'm done covering the Arcane River, I'm gonna go over dailies that are not in the Arcane River that you should probably do because they give. A lot of useful stuff. The first one being Monster Park. 
Now, Monster Park has a rotation. Every day, it gives something different. So, for example, on Monday, you get crafting materials, which isn't that great. Tuesday, not that great either. You get enhancement items. This is good for reg server, not necessarily here. Wednesday, you get trait items, which could be useful to increase your damage, assuming that you don't have max insight or ambition. Ambition giving you ignore enemy defense, and insight giving you elemental resist, which is roughly around 3-5% to of your final damage against bosses. The Thursday is honor, which is used to reset your inner ability, which is good. Friday, gold, you get mesos. Sometimes you get... Wealth Accumulation Potions, I don't have one in my inventory, but sometimes you can get Wealth Accumulation Potions from Friday, which is fairly nice. Saturday is everything. You can get rewards from all the other days, including Sunday, which I will cover right about now. Sunday is XP Coupons. Now, right now, I suggest that you don't open up your Sunday boxes because they give 1.5x coupons. Eventually, there is going to be a patch that will make anything you open from the Sunday box 2x coupons and strictly 2x coupons. So, I suggest you just hold on to these until, you know, until that update comes out. But, generally, the rewards are pretty good besides Monday and Tuesday. They're kind of, eh. But, um, yeah. Not only that, from the boxes, you get Monster Park uh, commem commemorative coins. Now, with these Monster Park commem commemorative coins, oh my god, you can buy Monster Park potions. Probably the most important buffs in the game that you should pretty much have whenever you're doing literally anything. Now, the red and the blue potion will give you 2,000 uh, 2, HP for the red potion and 2,000 MP for the blue potion. And then they give you 30 attack and 30 magic attack, respectively. This is very important. 30 attack and 30 magic attack stacks with any other buffs. These are stackable and they last for 30 minutes, which is, you know, obviously how long you will be in a boss for. The green potion is universally good, you know, whether you're a physical attacking class or a magical attacking class. The green potion increases your attack speed level by one, which is just so good especially I mean for all of my cannoneer and luminous players this potion is critical it's so good because it gets you closer to that maximum attack speed cap um, the gold potion is also really good it gives you 10% XP for 30 minutes and it costs double of what these cost the greed pendant is also fairly useful now the greed pendant increases the drop rate of equipment by 20%. I'm pretty sure this includes boss equipment. I'm not too sure. It's usually been up in the air on whether this is actually the case or not. So take that with a grain of salt. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it does. Now, if you want a damage skin, you can go for this one. It's serviceable. It looks pretty all right. I would highly suggest that you spend your coins on these though because you know you can you can you can use you know other coins to get damage skins from events and stuff like that now the badges now the badges aren't bad they do give it 10% IED or ignore enemy defense on the day that the badge is on so Mano being Monday uh, Chiu being Tuesday, Wodan being Wednesday, so on and so forth for the rest of them. And the stats aren't that bad, they're comparable to the Crystal Ventus badge, if you don't have a potable badge. For anybody who has a potable badge, stop laughing, that's not funny, okay? Now, if you do get all seven, you can fuse it into a better badge, which has a set effect with the seven day Monster Parker title, which I'll get into on how to get this in just a second which gives you an extra 10% IED, and when you fuse all these seven badges, you will get 10% IED no matter, just 10% IED indefinitely. Now, considering the cost of these and the fact that it's for mesos, 15 billion for each, I highly suggest that you don't buy these, unless if you are literally the child of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, 
because these are very expensive and 15 billion can, you know, in a lot of cases get you end game equipment. This is something I highly don't suggest unless if you're absolutely balling for some reason. But uh, yeah, so essentially when you enter Monster Park, there will be a quest and that quest will tell you to do Monster Park for 11 weeks. So 77 attempts in Monster Park for each day of the week. Now when you finish that, you will get the 7 day Monster Park title. You can enter 7 times a day, so hence why it's 11 weeks. And you can buy Monster Park coupons from the cash shop from either reward points, uh, if I could find it, reward points or or through mesos if you're in reboot. If you're in reg server, this is not a thing. So, yeah. This is a good tool for leveling in the early game, but also a good tool for the end game titles and end game buffs that you can get. Now, I suggest that you scale along with the level that you're at. And you do whatever is for your level. So if you're level 210, do Choo Choo. If you're level 220, do Latchlin. If you're level 230, do Arcana. These all give a decent amount of XP. Now, once you hit level 240, I suggest that you stop doing whatever is for your level because it won't give that good XP anymore. And I suggest that you always do Knight Stronghold because the map layout here is superior. It is so good. And the... The fact that you can save 10 minutes a day just doing this monster park in comparison to the others is worth it over the other monster parks. Because essentially what happens is that your time becomes increasingly more important and obviously monster park does not scale beyond level 230 so eventually you'll hit a point where Monster Park at the maximum level hits diminishing returns and you only want to do it for the end game buffs and save yourself the time so that you can farm and get yourself mesos and everything you need, whatever, blah, 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 blah. Now, this is also good for mules. So you can only enter seven times per world. So if you want to enter on a mule, make sure that you don't enter on your main because if you enter on your main the entry count will be diminished for your mules please just keep that in mind because monster park is also a good tool for leveling on mules okay that's everything for monster park ah uh, yes ursus or welfare Ursus is uh, pretty good for a multitude of reasons. Um, one being that it's a good early game title that you can get after beating Ursus 10 times, so after 4 days. Because you can attempt Ursus 3 times a day. Um, you can also get a good end game buff that stacks with other buffs, the Ursus Atmospheric buff. Spell traces, other stuff, the other stuff isn't really useful, I mean the buff and like maybe the epic potential scrolls or the damage skins do have their uses um, but usually it's for the buff and the best part is the money so there's two sections of the day in which you can make double the money from Ursus now if you do this from 9 p.m. Eastern, sorry I had to get my bearings there, 9 p.m. Eastern to 11 p.m. Eastern is a double meso period and from 2 p.m. Eastern to 4 p.m. Eastern is another period for double meso. Now essentially what it does or what you do in Ursus, I don't have any runs left for today, is you go in, you hit this bear and you try to help your teammates and take out the boss. It's fairly straightforward, it usually dies in like 5 seconds because the amount of damage that people do is absolutely ridiculous and you walk away with your money. It gives you 100 mil per day after you do your 3 runs on 2x usually and it scales slightly depending on what level you are in. But uh it's it's not it's not that significant. So but you want to make sure that when you go into Ursus 
that you are doing damage to the boss because if you die out as soon as you go in you will not get any money for the run and usually this can be associated with bad computers i haven't really tested this with 64 bits so i wouldn't know if it's you know still feasible on a not so great computer but yeah you want to make sure that as soon as you get in just get a couple hits on the boss it's better than nothing and get your money call it a day you know Paydays, uh, paydays every day, I guess, aka welfare. And one more thing, um, if you do enough damage, so if your character is decently funded, you could go into Ursus solo and do roughly around 200 billion damage. So you'll see it as two, 200 million K, so 200 billion damage, so 200 million K. So once you do roughly around that amount of damage, you can just go in and die, and you'll still get the rank that you need to get your money for for the day. There are a couple ranks, um, but primarily the only ones that you need to know are S, which is 60,000 points, double S at 140,000 points, and triple S at 150,000 points. Now, there's no real difference between the three besides just a little bit of extra money, but Triple S does reward you an extra medal if you are collecting medals. Ah, yes. Our favorite Galux, or as I like to call them, Helux, because you just have to disregard literally every single other mode that isn't Hell Mode Galux. Now, Galux is the worst boss in the game that gives you the best endgame gear. He is so fucking boring, but you have to do him because... Getting the gear from Galux is absolutely critical. The belt, for example, the superior belt, gives 60 stat and 35 attack without any sort of enhancements on it. Yes, the belt is your new weapon. This is your arcane weapon, essentially. And the fact that mine is 22 stars gives me 120 attack. Yes, my belt is literally another weapon. Why this is the case, I have no idea, but... This belt is broken. It is so good. Not even just the belt. The pendant is good. The ring is good. The superior earrings, good. Hell, even the reinforced ring is good. You can like This ring is also best in slot. Both of these rings, the reinforced and superior rings. Now, there's no real suggestions that I can give for Galux besides just enhance your gear and get stronger most of his attack patterns are random which is kind of rough and if you're not strong enough and you know you do want the superior equipment as fast as possible there are frequently people who give out carries and people who are willing to help new players progress into the set because of how helpful it is time for me to sell out by the way i stream every day at twitch.tv slash akka3 every oh well not every day but you know on the days that i can at 6 p.m eastern for four hours usually and i give out helix carries every single day on reset which is at 8 p.m eastern so if you do want helix and you do want to ask questions about daily specifically then please feel free to head on out over there because you can probably get more specific and detailed answers now, in the second phase of Helux, there is kind of an attack pattern, if you do want to know the mechanics. Typically, you want to stay to the left when he casts a curse, which he casts a curse every time he enters the phase. And then you want to enter the middle because he starts, he starts throwing hands, he wants to fight you. But, um, yeah. Actually, did I do Galax today? Maybe I can, uh, let's see, let's see what I can do here. Will it let me? No, it won't. Okay, so you know what? I'll show you guys what a typical run of Helix looks like on one of my alternate characters. So, initially when you start doing Galux, you will only have the Galux key replica, which will start you at the bottom of Galux. Now, when you use this key, you need to make sure that you climb up to the top without destroying any of the shoulders or destroying the abdomen. You need to make sure that you go into the head of Galux without destroying anything. 
Now, once you clear Helux for the first time, I'm pretty sure you can also get this from Hard Galux. But, we'll just assume that you clear Helux. You will get a purple key. The purple key will take you straight to the head. So you don't have to deal with any of the bullshit and your Galux clears will be much faster. But for now, I will showcase the whole thing and what it looks like from the ground up. Assuming that you do this from the first time. So you'll pretty much have a body UI. Um, you just need to make sure that you go to the left here or the right. Either one. It's just that the left will be inversed. Take out the mobs. This is fine. This is totally normal. This is what you have to do to progress to the boss. This is kind of just like your... Your warm-up. Call it a warm-up. That's what it is. Yes, it is a warm-up. So you take out these mobs. Go along your merry way. And then you'll get to the... Pretty much the arm. Now this is where you need to be careful. Because if you take the top portal that we that will take you to the shoulder and if you kill the shoulder that will reduce the difficulty from helux to hard lux now you need to make sure that you're taking the portal to the center here and this will take you pretty much to the room where you need to go to get to the head you're gonna ignore everything because these will the bottom left and the bottom right portals will take you to the arm the top left and the top right will take you to the shoulders the bottom, middle, will take you to the abdomen, and the top will take you to the head. The head is where the actual boss is, and this is what you will be dealing with. This is what your actual concern is. Now, Helux has 350 billion HP in Phase 1, and 350 billion HP in Phase 2. Now, there's also a Phase 3 that only lasts 90 seconds, and you will need to do 70 billion damage. So, there is a certain amount of damage that you need to do to kill Helux. Now, Helux is fairly straightforward. You just need to make sure that you're jumping from side to side and dodging the attacks. There are three attacks, primarily being the hand. If you get hit by the hand, that is a one-hit KO. There is that breath right there, or as I like to call the exhale. If you get hit by the exhale, it will do 50% of your health. And it will also stun you in place for 2 to 3 seconds. And then there is the inhale. The inhale will do 50% of your health instantly. And then drag you towards the center. If you do get pushed into the center from the inhale, then it will kill you from full health and heal Galux by... I think it's roughly around 20 to 25%. Now, there's also these little rocks that spawn in Helux. Now, thing is that you need to take out these rocks because if the rocks reach the center, then you will get a stack. And when the stacks reach 5, you will die. That's it, you will die. So you need to make sure that you're killing the rocks and they don't reach the center. And that's pretty much it for phase 1. There's nothing really interesting here. Now the hitboxes in Galux are very, very wonky. So make sure that when he attacks, make sure that you're going fairly wide to dodge the attack. But then stay close to the center so that you can move to the other side when another attack comes out. That's pretty much it for phase 1. So I'll get to phase 2 here. If I can actually attack him for more than a second you can tell that this is one of the big issues with Galux that he doesn't you know necessarily do anything frightening he's just annoying and he consumes a lot of your time because you can't necessarily sit in one spot and hit him okay so as soon as you get to Galax Phase 2, he will cast a curse. And typically what you want to do is you want to hug the far left side of the map. This curse will inverse your movement and then after a short period of time, it will do 99% of your HP. So you want to make sure that you're not getting hit by it because if you get hit by it, you're pretty much dead because he does a full map attack afterwards that does like 30% of your health. So try to avoid that as best as you can. Uh, not only that, in phase 2 he throws arms. 
which is arms, will also one-shot, just like phase one. But he will throw the arms specifically on top of the gold portals here. So you want to make sure that after he casts the curse, you come into the center of the map. So that you don't get absolutely obliterated by the arms. Now, there usually is a pattern for how he casts his abilities. He usually throws out an arm or two before he... Okay, wait. Let, let, it, let it restart so I can explain this properly. So it starts with a curse, as you can see there. Then you can move into the center. It's usually a full map attack or a hand to start. There's no particular order, it's just that he does these number of I'm dead. Okay, this is this is very scuffed. Let me let me go to the lobby. You can leave if you don't have any stacks applied to you, that's another thing. If you don't have any stacks from the little boys, you can leave. But if you do have a stack, then you won't be able to leave. So essentially these attacks so essentially essentially these attacks are applied at random before he casts another curse it's usually one full map attack which does 30 percent of your hp one bottom platform attack which summons these orbs that do 50 percent each they spawn in order at random it's kind of weird and then he throws his hand on the platforms three times before he casts another curse Remember, these attacks are random, so just make sure that you're ready for all of them. So, essentially what you want to do is you want to start at the left when phase 2 starts. He casts the curse, and then you move into the center near the middle of both platforms. And just jump between them so you don't get hit by the hands. So you don't get knocked off the platforms when he casts the full map attack. And so that you're not at the bottom when he casts the orbs that will kill you. Essentially, that's it for Gallux. You just need to make sure that you're balancing in between. And then after he casts all of those abilities, so after you've seen him cast three hands, a full map attack, and the orbs at the bottom, make sure you're at the left again so that the, so that the curse does not hit you. That is the only place where the curse does not hit you, at the left side of the map. So here's an example of what it should look like. So there you go, I'm at the left side because of the curse. Now I can move into the center. So he casted the orbs at the bottom. Now he casted a hand. I can still stay in the center here. That's the full map attack. Another hand. So I can wait for one more hand before he casts the curse. And there you go, and there's the curse. And then it repeats, so on, so forth. Now, sometimes the pattern shifts up. Sometimes he only throws two hands instead of the usual three and casts an extra full map attack. But yet again, that depends. Now, what you can do to stay safe is kind of just hug the left side and jump off the platform. But if you do want to maximize your damage to Gallux, you want to make sure that you're moving into the center so that the hands don't displace you as often as they do. There you go, three hands, so now I just stay at the left. Because he's going to cast the curse, and I know I'm safe. There you go, and I can continue doing damage. Note, you can also use iframes and stuff to block any pattern that gets thrown your way in an awkward kind of way. There you go, that's another hand, so there's probably going to be one more before he casts the curse again. There you go. And now I can continue to burst because he's going to cast the curse now. And now I can move into the center again. So there you go. There are the orbs. A hand. Dodge the hand. Stay near the center. We know that more abilities are going to come out. The orbs again. So there's usually going to be only two hands this time. He's going to throw one more before he casts the curse. Oh, no. He casted orbs again. Okay, so... There you go. So for every time he casts the orbs, it reduces the amount of hands that he throws before he casts the curse. So for example... 
If he casts the orbs three times, there will only be one hand. If he casts the orbs twice, there will be two hands. And if he casts the orbs once, then it will be only be one hand before he casts the curse. And essentially, you just want to stay away from it. Now, for thieves, you can dark sight the curse and it will do no damage to you. So, if you're a thief, you kind of kind of luck out in this regard. So, rejoice in that in that case, I guess. But uh, yeah, Golok's pretty pretty straightforward. It's just his hitboxes are a lot bigger than they look, which makes him very annoying. And the randomness in his pattern makes it hard for you to really consistently do damage. But once you get the hang of it, it's fairly straightforward, I would say. And obviously, drop rate at the end does affect the box. For, I think, a gear that's under superior. I don't know if it actually su affects superior gear. Don't quote me on that because there's no real information out about it. Not only that, one thing I should probably note is that... Galux or Helux has a 30 second potion cooldown. So that's why it's important to dodge literally every single thing you can besides the full map attack. Because you can't dodge a full map attack. So... You need to make sure that you're not getting hit by the orbs or anything on the map or else you will die. And you only have 5 death count, so treat it properly because Elux is not very functional. So now you do that and you get your loot and this time I got garbage, but sometimes you can get superior equipments. But the only superior equipments that will drop from Helux is the superior belt and the superior earrings. The ring and the pendant will not drop. You have to buy those from the store. So what I suggest when you first start getting into Helux is to buy your is to buy your pendant and buy your earrings or sorry, no, buy your pendant and buy your ring before you buy your earrings or your belt. Wait before you get drops, before you progress into the superior set. But yeah, that's it for Helux. Kind of an extensive, I would say, extensive section, but there is a lot to cover because Helux is fairly important for progressing into the endgame. And last, but most certainly not least, is Kamurchi Republic. Now, this is a quest that you need to do to unlock the Kamurchi in dailies, I guess you can call it. So realistically, you only need to go halfway until you unlock a quest in your quest bulb. Sometimes it appears at the bottom, sometimes it appears at the top. It's a level 140 quest and it's called Get Rich Quick. So once you unlock that, you can go to Maestra or Ma Maestre, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but essentially it's... A daily where you go on a boat, hit some mobs, and you get dinaros. And with those dinaros, you can buy almost the best in slot. Face accessory, eye accessory, pendant, and the earrings are useless. This is equivalent to garbage. But essentially, the close to best in slot, face accessory, eye accessory, and pendant. Now, essentially what you do in this daily is you go in... I'm Sorry, I'm in a party with myself. Essentially, you go in and you hit mobs and it'll reward you dinaros. Now, before you go in, you want to make sure that you're using your dinaros to spend on items which will increase your income for that specific run. So, for example, if I don't have any soap, I get zero gold through my income. If I have one soap, still zero. Two soap is one. And let's say I had like some glasses or some black pepper, it goes up respectively, right? But usually you just want to do four soap because it's the same thing as adding the glasses or the pepper. And there are different regions, but heavily I suggest just doing 10 dolch because it takes you like five minutes and you can go along with your day. If you were to do regions like Rosa, Luna, Herbtown and beyond, your daily runs will probably be extended to... 15 to 20 minutes or more so hence why I suggest just save the time on dolch because the difference in the dinaros that you get is Three or four at the very most so Yeah, 
And obviously, the further you go in terms of destinations, the harder it will get. Now, one thing I do suggest is when you start Kamurchi, progress along with the quest line to unlock things like Luna, Rosa, and Herbtown when you get to that point. Now, the only reason why I suggest unlocking Herbtown is it because it unlocks a party quest. Now, this party quest is for a group of three, which I don't have right now because, you know, uh, life's tough. I don't have any friends. <laughs> okay. But essentially, you go in as a group of three, and it's just like the normal Kamurchi party quest. The solo Kamurchi party quest, if you will. But just slightly more difficult, and you get just extra dinaros on top of, you know, on top of your solo dinaros. Hence why I suggest unlocking Herbtown, because this party quest is pretty good. And I highly suggest that you grab two of your friends and... Do some party quests but once again what i suggest is just doing 10 dolch put in four soaps and going along your merry way there will be three spawns when you do the dolch um the dolch voyage if you will there is going to be a group of 20 pirates a group of 15 sirens and a rock that's the best way to explain it. Once you take these three out, your run will be done. You'll get two uh, gold from the soaps that you put in and one bonus income. And then you just repeat this 10 times to get your 30 daily denaro. Do your CPQ and you'll get roughly 50 denaro a day, which will give you the Sweetwater Tattoo, the Monocle, and the Pendant. And this is what a typical run would look like. So I'll show that right about now. So, you know, you set up, you go in, you put your deployables, do whatever you need to do. Right. On the small little ship, you can pretty much ignore the abilities for the ship because they're very, very useless. Because Nexon thought it was a good idea to add those. We, we, don't, we don't talk about these. You can essentially just ignore these because they're not useful at all. So, you just want to use your own strength to... Take out the mobs to say the very least. And that's what it looks like. Simple as that. And you do that 10 times over. Now, another thing you can do with Denaros is you can take it to this boy over here. You can take it to... I'm not even going to try pronouncing that name. But essentially, what you can do is you can transpose equipment. Transposing takes the flames of one item and the stars or the enhanced stats of one item and transfers it to a sweet water item. Now, the item that is transferring into the sweet water has to be level 140 and above. So 140 to 150 items and it transposes into sweet water level 160 items. So for example, if I wanted to, uh, you know, my inventory is kind of full, but essentially, let's say, for example, because this is something that you do want to do, I want to transpose my Dominator Pendant into a Sweetwater Pendant. I would go in here, I would talk to him, transpose an item, I would put my Dominator Pendant here, and then I would put my Sweetwater Pendant here. Now, this is something that you can attempt 10 times a day, and it will consume 10 Denaros for each time you do it. Now, the only time I suggest that you transpose is when your items have a flame of over 100 and they are 16 stars specifically. The whole reason to transpose is to carry the strong flames of the Dominator Pendant or the, um, the Papillatus Mark, for example, because that's another item that you want to transpose. You take these strong flames and the stars that you get from these equipments and transfer it into a Sweetwater item. So essentially what you get is when I transpose a Dominator Pendant into a Sweetwater Pendant is I get a 15 star item with plus 8 attack and whatever flame I have now. So if I were to transpose this into a Sweetwater item I'd get 8 attack and then whatever flame I have now which is 5% all stat and 12 luck. But essentially you want to go higher because you only get one shot at this. And once you transpose, you know, especially for rare items like the Papillatus Mark, you want to make sure that you're getting the best out of your transposing. 
Now, this is only something that you should do when you have a lot of dinaro because this becomes very expensive because transposing has a 3 to a 5% success rate. So you will, for the most part, be hitting those 10 attempts per day and you will be spending hundreds and hundreds of dinaros to transpose your equipment. But once you do, you will get extremely powerful equipment. Let me go on my cannoneer and showcase some of it. Okay, so now we're on the cannoneer and this is what a typical transposed equipment would look like. The Sweetwater Monocle has a 5% all stat, 45 stat, and 5 attack flame, which is roughly equivalent to 105 stat. Now, you can also notice that even though I only have 2 stars, I have an extra 29 attack, which is absolutely absurd. When I get this thing to 22 stars, this thing will probably have close to 100 attack. This is just an example of what transpose equipments look like, and it is very, very important that you try to transpose both your pendant and your eye accessory. Now, you can't transpose your face accessory because there is no level 140 to 150 face accessory, so this is just try your best to flame it and star it like a normal item. Same thing goes with the earrings because the earrings, you can't do anything with the earrings because you'll be equipping Gallux in the end game. You'll probably learn about that as you go along. And the same thing, uh, actually, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is that you can also level up your boat from a normal boat to a sailboat once you hit level 10 on the first boat. That costs 250 dinaros. And then when you get a sailboat to level 10, you can upgrade it to a dreadnought. And essentially what this does, and the dreadnought upgrade costs 500, and basically what this does is it gives you more energy to fit in more dailies, and you can fit more items per daily. So what it does is it gives you more space to make more gold per run, and it gives you more runs per day. So if you're just getting into the game, then I highly suggest upgrading your boat because it'll be a worthy long time investment. Now, there is one more thing that I do want to cover, and that is daily bosses. This is optional and for my early game players. Now, if you do want daily bosses and you do want an extra source of income because you feel like the farming that you're doing in early game is not really proving to give you much, then you can optionally do daily bosses, which gives you reward points, things like Master Craftsman Cubes, and a decent sum of money every day. It's roughly around 45 to 50 mil. Now, the daily bosses that I suggest that you do if you want to do daily bosses is Normal Magnus, which sells for 8 million mesos. Normal Papalatus, which also sells for 8 million mesos. You'll see a trend here. Hard Von Leon, which sells for 7.5 million mesos. Normal Pink Bean, which sells for 4.5 million mesos, but he also drops 3 Rocks of Time, which sells for 1 million mesos each. Arcarium sells for 8 million mesos. And you can get a Dominator Pendant drop from Arcarium, which is very useful when transposing to your Sweetwater Pendant. So this is one that I would highly suggest if you don't have a Dominator Pendant. This is almost necessary, I would say. Um, let's see, what else? I would also suggest doing Normal Ranmaru if you have the time that sells for 8 mil. And yeah, essentially that's it. It's a couple bosses that give a decent bit of money, decent bit of cubes, decent bit of stuff. This is optional, and when you get to your weekly bosses, I suggest that you try to stay away from daily bosses because the returns on these become diminishing as you go on, or they start to diminish as you go on, because Realistically, these are made for early game players, so once you start to shred these bosses, it's not worth your time. Just go farm instead. The node stones that you get from farming and the mesos that you get is much more worth, I would personally say. Oh boy, that should be everything for the important dailies that I highly suggest. 
Hopefully you guys learned something and hopefully this was informative in some way on how to get your dailies done and how to do them as as efficiently as possible. Now, I would have liked to go more in detail in the Arcane River dailies, but that's the truth of the situation is that just a lot of those dailies are just practice and something you have to get into the habit to in order to clear them as fast as possible. But um yeah, if you guys do have questions and you want them answered instantly in the most detail possible, you can check out my Twitch. I stream not every day, but the days that I can. I stream live at 6 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash akad3. And, you know, come hang out, you know, if you have any questions, comments, Anything that you want to mention, I will be there. But um, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed. Remember to like, comment, and sub, or I will literally consume your mesos faster than Star Forcing does. Thanks.